pretty psychedelic. It's pretty psychedelic. Yeah. It's psychedelic on the order of that, like, rampant, uh, neon, like, weechel weed <laughs> You know what I mean? Um, sort of. It's, a uh, pretty fucking weird looking. Okay, so... What should we do first? Well, you had an interesting... Why don't you do... <laughs> you said you were feeling some more anti-Christian ranting might bubble up this morning. Since you're thinking about it this morning, you should just jump into that. I, I, I'm all I years. I said that as like a warning, like apologizing ahead of time, not as like a thing I'm excited about to get into. Um, but we can do it. I also have some, I just, I have something to contribute to that. I don't know if it's an anti-Christian rant, but it is a rant about uh, future, like, so when I was, when you're driving here, um, I was driving through Texas and, you know, you're passing a lot of, um, you know, predictable Texas things like cows, barns, um, you know, like oil shit, you know what I mean? Um, and, uh, I was also surprised to see that the thing I didn't expect was a fuck ton of wind farms, like just these oh. giant, like just, uh, you know, the wind turbine, like these big steel towers, just like, going. and I was driving and I was like, oh, that's a weird looking wind, wind tower. And so I got a little closer to it and I was like, oh, that's not a wind tower. It is a giant 150 foot tall steel crucifix standing in a <laughs> Next to like this little like shack that was like apparently like a some church or something like standing in the field with like hundreds of other like wind turbines. And um, I just it was striking because I started to get like some real like Star Trek vibes from like these like mega structures in a field um, with and I was like thinking it really speaks to the idea of like what is now it's like we're reaching toward the future make you know like old school religion is like competing with the the image of like just a field full of wind turbines it was like extremely futuristic i'm gonna go sit on the floor over here until that suv drives off i was i was thinking i was triggered on that on my feelings about christians today's christians specifically right uh when you had that prompt about the galaxies and oh yeah all the all the billions of stars and stuff yeah cuz one of the first well maybe you should read the prompt and then I'll yeah yeah let me read the prompt this is so and I'll last, say where my mind went so last night i did i was a little bit tipsy on wine and i uh it occurred to me what are the implications of the fact that there are billions of galaxies in the universe that somehow, somewhere, unimaginable things are happening? And does the contemplation of this have any relevance to our life? Yeah, and I remembered um, an interview with this, uh, I don't know what you call him. He's a scientist and he's Christian and he's written books on making a scientific case for God and it's generally called the God Hypothesis. Mm. And I'm sure that's the name of one of his books, too. Um, I'll time stamp so he can get his name. And he and that's one of the answers to your question is, well, it's proof of God. Like there's so many, there's so yeah. much. A lot of there's, people take it that way. There's so much out there and it's all uh, performing <laughs> to um, <clears throat> mathematical precision and beauty. It's it's the literal music of the spheres going on. Yeah. And, and we're just sailing through it at like hella miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and it's this but it's this answer that like I listened to that an interview or two with this God hypothesis author thinking that like there'd be something interesting yeah. to it. And I, I was so 
bored. It, it was like <laughs> it was like a way to shut down the inquiry instead of the opposite. And and that is an understandable psychological impulse, isn't it? To look at the vastness of infinity and well, what kind of answers have we come to before? Um, these very simplistic like children's fable answers. Like, like that God hypothesis guy, like in, in, in providing scientific datum that like points at our inability to understand things with our traditional rules. Um, he then makes a leap in logic to say that that means there's a monotheistic yeah, I one know. creator <laughs> I know. that I'm just going to like slip in that it's a man too. <laughs> and it just and also this this creator has chosen to speak to us through like a book um you know that where it's like really disputed what translation is the correct one and there's all this historical yeah. happenstance yeah it's a little bit it's that that is sort of an underexamined thing is that it's one thing to be like you know i think that there's some kind of ultimate intelligence in the universe it's a whole nother thing to be like and it's Jehovah and yes. you have to, and like, you should go to church. Like, but what is this? Two, two different, completely <laughs> different things. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like there's some people, some other people would like a word about that, <laughs> about their idea. Yeah. So it's, it's just so much more complicated, I think, than any established religious dogma can capture. Yeah. Like, you know, you have something wrong with your explanation of the universe when the Marvel Cinematic Universe hits at something intuitively more true just by po positing a multiverse so that they can be more lazy story writers and have cataclysmic events overlap each other. And it's a multiverse, so nothing matters. Yeah. It is pretty crazy that religious people don't expect better stories from their preachers that they're yeah. satisfied going there week after week after week and getting the same line like maybe it indicates that what you're going for is not really vision but it's like a sense of belonging you know i think that's very true but um yeah maybe that just means that there's like I don't know. I think that's why a lot of people are kind of attracted to orthodox forms of religion because they understand what it is they're providing to people. They're not providing answers. They're providing a sense of place. They're providing a, like an aesthetic, a sense of history. Yes. Like it's you might as well be clear about that. I, that. So I can really respect like a Catholic church that has like this incense and the ornamentations and the altars. And like I used to think that was like really, really stupid but I actually have kind of come around to the idea that if you're going to do have religion, make it, make it like you can't dispense with the kind of aesthetics and symbols of it. Because if you try, I think it's like a uniquely intellectualized kind of religion where it's like, we're going to go to church and sit in a um, prefab building at the base of a giant steel crucifix in the middle of a cow field and listen to this guy who is like also a trucker and but he came became a preacher and like we're you know we're gonna just i don't know if that's how like church in texas works or something. probably sort of most probably 99 percent true what i'm everything i'm saying right now but i mean it, yeah it's kind of like i think at some point religion is just going to become sci-fi Oh, because it's we're it's gonna have to come up with new stuff. It needs to become sci-fi as to become. soon as possible, in so my maybe, opinion. So maybe the giant steel crucifix is a good is a good step in that direction. That's why I'm saying I was getting Star Trek vibes. Yeah. From from this weird field with like giant technological and religious monuments like dotting it. I I have a I have a conflict with the whole issue, and that's why I have any emotional response to it at all. Yeah. Uh, is because I do pray. I, I do have a spiritual relationship with a God image. Um, uh, but spirituality uh, until now, uh, like up until now, 
spirituality seems to be at odds with religion. Um, you can you can sometimes accidentally make religions with your spirituality, um, and you can sometimes find spirituality in your religion. Um, but mostly it's just another bureaucratic body. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Used to put something in between you and your present moment so you don't have to examine things as closely as you might otherwise. Um, but the conflict, yeah, is, is with how much we do get out of it and how much is lost when you don't have it. And... Uh, like I'm thinking of the Joe Rogan episode with this doctor. Did I send it to you that day? Yeah, that I, the one I that he got in big trouble for. Did he? I mean, judging by the uh, reaction of like um, Twitter and stuff, people don't. You know, well, I mean, that's I guess that's to me expected. There's only kind of one. Narr- there's only one take you're kind of allowed to have about COVID. In it's public. only one response allowed and that's like yeah. a big part of the doctor's point yeah um and interestingly you can f- i don't know if joe rogan did this himself made his own call or it's just everything of this guy is censored off youtube um one of the greatest doctors in the country by the way like as far as what credit credit crediting like processes we have to uh, show who's a good doctor and who's not he's got the most he's like yeah. the of western medicine Macolo is like the top of how much you can how many awards you can like pile on a guy um but there's no you can't find any clips of the show on youtube like mm. they post clips of every episode themselves onto youtube so that you know what the new episode is and there just aren't any for this guy. It's a very, well, it's like Morrissey. I was telling you about Morrissey. I was trying to find the new Morrissey album. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to find news, any news about the new Morrissey album. And there's just nothing because you're not allowed to talk about Morrissey unless it's to um, lambast him for not being woke enough. So you know that, um, you, wait, you know my theory, my theory on why I think the reason the why that episode is still up on Spotify is because Spotify paid up front. They um, mm-hmm. gave him his money. He already gave them money, and uh, there's not a lot that they stand to gain from uh, censoring that. I-, I think it's kind of like they'd probably be like a breach of contract or something like that. It's um, it's interesting, I think, to see how, in some sense, the introduction of like an explicitly um like an explicit legal contract about content distribution uh provide kind of like a backstop in this case um, yes getting it removed which is interesting because most of the time you think the opposite you're like oh when money gets introduced to media that usually causes more restrictions because people want to assert their you know their rights and stuff but this is like a weird inverse case where the money actually prevented the thing from getting removed because that transaction was like sanctified in a legal legal document whereas with youtube it's all implicit it's like well we're gonna make some ad money and you're gonna get some um you know use use of our distribution architecture and we're just gonna use each other but there's no explicit agreement one of us can back away if we sense that like there's an outward um you know like negative incentive because our platform is gonna get a bad reputation for hosting this or whatever so it's, it's fascinating i think it, it but, shows that perhaps it points to the value of formalized agreements. Yeah, the contracts are fucking important. And, yeah, contracts are very important. And contract technology, fortunately, yeah. is yeah. getting much better. And we can we can get into that a little bit later. Absolutely. Um, I'll let you finish this thing, though, without derailing it. <laughs> uh, McCullough, in my eyes, he's an American hero. This guy is working to save lives mm-hmm. and is taking the issue of COVID seriously and trying to save as many lives as possible. Um, And uh, and the like, you can tell this guy is working uh, 14 hour days, probably seven days a week. 
he's probably been going at that rate since COVID started. Mm. And so he's seeing patients and he's overseeing a medical journal and he's trying to get research going in the right areas. He's trying to blow the whistle on the inability of anyone to get early treatment medication. Um, and he's running his own podcast, obviously, and he's been going full blast. And you can tell by coming out of those three hours of listening to him on Joe Rogan, he, you could tell he was fucking loving it. Like, it really was having the time of his life battling the fight of his life and using all his credentials and using all his experience of being a doctor at the top of his field uh, for his whole career, trying to use it like in a wider context, not just in the specific stay in your lane thing that doctors are encouraged to do. Um, and I don't think it's any coincidence that he's Christian and he's one of the few doctors who thinks or sees that values are being violated and the Nuremberg, uh, whatever it's called, the Nuremberg Agreement or something is being violated. Like, this is a moral issue. This is evil. There are evil things afoot. And I don't think it's a coincidence that he's one of the only doctors in the country who will speak up about it. I think it's because he has an existential uh, foundation within. He has a spiritual relationship with something greater than himself. Yeah, I think that's something, there's something there about um, the content of your transcendent image being sort of less important than the fact that you have a transcendent image at all. Um, I do, it does seem to me that um, like secularism is kind of running a kind of like simulation, I think, about what gods it should have. Um, and, you know, it's, I may, it might be like just the process of ecological adaptation to having um, this vacuum opened up, this space for like what matters you know i think society um have it's not really been able to um articulate what it's missing in the last what like what like what we're not like what we are what we are deprived of it's hard to say what that is and so there's a kind of like experimental process of raising up various issues that have some kind of moral component as like to see if they can be like deified or see if they can be wrapped in ritual and they can see if they can be sort of like put out like more feelers to other meme complexes so that they'll stick into the cultural fabric. Um, so from that perspective, it's less surprising that someone who was a Christian would, um, you know, subscribe to covidism kind of like how you know most converts to um the various other evangelical religions at this point don't themselves have some strong religious preference like you know like in most most religions like being an apostate is a big deal i think like in islam or at least the more strict conservative interpretations you can be killed for leaving the religion so it's just like not something you do um you know which is why <laughs> it's perhaps just the most important thing is to call it for what it is, which is a belief system. And uh, you have to come to that as basic terms before you even, it really even makes sense to talk about like which belief is better. It's like everyone at the table needs to believe that they have a metaphysical bias towards thinking that like, well, science is my God or Jehovah's my God, or, you know, a lot of people are resistant to this because they think that science is somehow uniquely rational and it's uniquely insulated from dogma. But Perhaps, you know, the last two years, if they've shown me anything, is that yeah. education is a risk factor for accepting 
dogma, any kind of education, religious education, secular education. It's inst- uh, like education is the precursor to institutionalization. It's not to say education is bad. It's just as dangerous. It's powerful. Like most tools that are powerful that are dangerous. Um, yeah. It's just things, things have to grow. Things can't stand still. Mm. And so that's my issue with the question of, is it religious thought? Is it uh, scientific rationalism and atheism gets smuggled into that? Um, I, I have a sort of, I don't know if it's a mantra or a tenet. I guess it's one of my tenets that there are only steps forward. And I just say that out loud to myself sometimes in quiet moments. And it, so applying that lens to my life, I was raised in a church half of the time in a divorced household. Um, so I ingested all of that Protestant Christian dogma. And after a certain point, it didn't serve my growth into a free thinking being. So I just shelved all questions of Christian morality and um, went, uh, went on my merry way. And going forward on that path led me back to not Christianity, but to the importance of a spiritual path and the importance of uh, activating that spiritual hemisphere in your brain and being creatively active there as well as everywhere else in your life. And so I did have to come back to the things I'd discarded and brush them off and keep leveling them up. So letting go of religion was a step forward coming back to it with a lot more Eastern thoughts and a lot more respect for the Western religious thoughts to make a new mosaic of truth that was fitting uh, the more expansive personal experience that that was being inflicted upon me. Um, That was also a step forward and, and Chris like overt, Christians trying to deal with 2021 are it seems like they're not taking a step forward in their Mm -hmm. spiritual thought they're just hiding away from things um and i'll finish this rant with an anecdote from a new elon musk interview where he came on to this podcast with uh the babylon b and that's the successor to the onion the Christian conservative successor to the onion. Oh, is it Christian and conservative? It's lightly conservative and run by Christians. So it's uh, it's it's taking advantage of the newly resurgent market for um, conservative political memes. Well, it's just there's a market in making jokes about yeah. how stupid woke people are. Exactly. Which and, well, that that is to say that's the yeah. res- right. yes. So, so three of these dudes that run this company, this satire news website, mm. like The Onion, um, had Elon Musk on. <clears throat> and they're all sipping water. Elon Musk is sipping a White Claw. <laughs> uh, they all are, um, well, they're all clean shaven, but like all, the dudes are all like, a Christian kind of clean shaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, whenever Elon Musk curses, it's very explicit uh, and conspicuous that Elon Musk curses because they bleep it out of the video. No way. They bleep, the they bleep it out and it's very noticeable. And so uh, it just conspicuously points out that this entire 90 minutes all all three of these guys haven't cursed the entire time and elon musk just like by talking like a normal person he ends up cursing a few times and so i like just kind of put myself in the seat of that room and like 
remembered what that moment is like, like a polite Christian, just politely keeping their mouth shut and like a tight little prim smile <laughs> <laughs> when you curse. <laughs> and, but like, you know, it's a private superiority complex going on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And I've been in those rooms, man. I've been in those rooms. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and this is partly where my prompt about Elon Musk is coming from. And maybe I'll read it in a little bit uh, since we're there. But those four people, who's the most spiritual man in that room? Honestly, yeah. Elon fucking Musk. Of course. He has his he has a finger on what God is trying to do with the universe much more than those three Christians do. Absolutely. And, and what the, so what, so something is wrong with the Christian thought. If, if that's the case, like being, being Christian should like, that should be for Elon Musk's in the room. If, if you're abiding, if you're meditating on the fact that there's this like cosmic omniscient, voice speaking in your heart to like push you to be better like it shouldn't <laughs> shouldn't like what else can you do except start a rocket company and know, yeah. and change change the energy infrastructure of the entire world yeah it's is it, i mean maybe it just points to how ridiculous it was that anyone ever thought that it would be possible to institutionalize and create a product called <laughs> spirituality like like the hubris you know what i mean like i, I don't know it, it's like we do take it for granted that like oh yes like hmm i got to get like i'm having some uh some issues with my back i'm going to go see the um the orthopedic guy and oh my, yeah i'm going to go see the dentist and like oh what about my <laughs> my soul oh uh look look in the phone book directory like churches mm, walk in like so you know our like just just kind of walk me through this like yeah. like how is yeah um okay like my critique of that is like would it be necessary for there to be a universe if that's all it took to <laughs> like solve the problem? Like, why is well, would life be necessary? Would God have created the world? And if, to, you know, it, 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 from a Christian's perspective, they could ask themselves this, you know. And and to your point, they they end they have the audacity at the end of this podcast to ask Elon Musk if he'll accept Christ into his heart as his personal Lord Wait, and Savior. Alex, are you sure that this is not high satire by the Babylon Bee? I fucking wish it was. I wish it was. Because if it was, <laughs> maybe it could be like I, a Stephen Colbert kind of thing where he's like playing the role of the- It's uh, not. I, it's not? It's not? It, okay. I, I sat through 90 minutes with these dudes. I don't think it is. Maybe I'm getting punked and they're fucking geniuses. <laughs> they certainly have balls. Um, but if, all, if just the fucking idea that you can say a magic phrase and emit, emit a magic prayer into the ether and now your soul's work is done and you've passed through this, this fiery hula hoop like and all questions of suffering are solved now <laughs> like what kind of how what kind of religion is i'm getting verklempt just trying to just that undersells the power of god to a blasphemous degree a disgusting degree to say that his goodness uh, can only be extended to people who emit the magical phrase of I'm asking Jesus into my heart as my personal Lord and Savior. Like, that's it. That, well, that's good, I mean, good, thing, good thing thousands and thousands of years of spiritual philosophical thought gave us that phrase yeah. or we'd be fucked. <laughs> Most of us are <laughs> fucked anyway because we can't speak English, but that's true. 
<laughs> that really sucks. That really sucks for those people. <laughs> I mean, I guess God was smart to pick English. It is the most widely spoken <laughs> language, so that was a good decision. Yeah. Um, I okay. I mean, well, so on along on a similar vein, I've had kind of. I've yes, I suppose I've thought of. It's like this kind of just basic silliness is also um, expressed in the image of the person who really does think that they believe, they believe that they believe that there is an omniscient um, spirit that rules the whole universe, even the faraway galaxies, and the spirit as you said, is informing you, suffusing your life with purpose and power and um, an assurance of cosmic um, sort of uh, meaning. If you really believed that in actuality, you wouldn't keep going to your job at the auto dealership down the street from the place where you go on Sunday and tell yourself that you believe that. I just don't know how you could, you can reconcile the humdrum day to day, mundane, football watching, barbecue having, social backstabbing, backslapping, <laughs> brouhaha that is about 60% of Americans' normal days, kind of, you know. I don't think that that story is very easily. It's not. It's kind of hard to weld that to like ancient mythology of like a voice from the sky speaking in your head. And so, what we do is take those symbols and put them in like a privileged location called big questions, and big questions get redirected to the God department. And so, it kind of like prevents people from, I think. The satisfaction of pursuing their curiosity, um, which you know maybe has something to do with the wa- f- fact that like people pursue like almost every other activity. This is if you're a member of the middle class, if you're a member of the enfranchised kind of like virtual reality of society, where you're not poor enough to where you're you know like the poor people are like dealing with fucking reality every single day. The rich people, they're dealing with reality too. They have all the power. And they're in reality. And then you have like the people in the middle that are like trying, they're striving, they're trying to do it, they're trying to, they're making, they've like broken even. And when you break even like that and you have big questions already pigeonholed for you in some sort of like, these are settled big questions, cultural consensus department, all that's left to you is to sort of like fiddle around with the stuff that you've the toys you find laying around you in your middle class existence so you pick them up and you go like this is really neat and then you become someone who's like super into smoking cigars or something like that and i'm not saying those things are bad but i think they are almost like the shock absorbers of that impulse and that's why we have like an incredible culture of wish fulfillment because all of those things are like these multifarious sublimated um, sort of like uh, re- um, reach it, like reaching for meaning. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So I don't know. I it's it's almost like I think it makes a lot of sense to think about this in terms of an economy. We hold on to that and let's jump to the next uh, All right, video. Good. Wait, thinking of it like an economy in terms of an economy. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what that means. So good. About yes. I think we were on the subject of there. I, I said that it made sense to think of there being kind of an economy of meaning as a way yes. to understand the competition between um, pop culture and religion. Um, I suppose what I mean by that is that um, it's not really possible to care about more than a handful of things genuinely at, at one time. And so there's limited space in people's metaphysical fucks given, uh, for lack of a better term. And um, 
you know, I don't know. I've, I guess I've been I've been thinking of this way of looking at. I've I've been using this lens on culture recently, where I kind of have been thinking about, I've been taking seriously the idea that ideas are using people to reproduce themselves. Yeah. And in that way of looking at things, people are not the originators of ideas most of the time. Some people are, but most people are the conduits through which ideas transmit themselves to other people. So there's an analogy to be made to Dawkins' notion of the selfish gene where genes are building bodies to propagate the genetic code um, in the sense that culture is like a set of ideas, some of which are more successful than others. And one of those, and these ideas, instead of competing in the space of limited food and reproductive partners, it's competing in the space of limited human um, fucks given or attention or sentience or um, embodied embodiment in a conscious vessel. So, you know, like something like a joke is funny, which makes you want to tell someone else. So that's an example of a meme pursuing um, reproductive success as a way of spreading itself. Or there's like some ideas that are more like, um, are less like a dandelion and more like a fucking oyster where what they do is they find a solid thing and they cling the fuck onto it and surround themselves with a hard shell. Mm -hmm. And both of those are survival strategies. Right. And I think in right. the case of something like a joke or a lot of ideological memes, what they are is um, they're things you want to tell other people because you get some kind of reward for telling them. Like you get social approval, you people laugh, it's funny. So there's like those are like the dandelion type of ideas. And then there's the kind of ideas like religion, which are the fucking um, like spore thingies that somehow – hide themselves within existential questions that can't be approached and thus are shielded from all forms of rational, um, like, uh, ex, um, excision. Mm. So uh, it's, a. Uh, I mean, maybe it's like completely inevitable that human beings are going to find a symbiosis with some kind of existential idea. I mean, I don't, I don't really know how you would go about living your life if by in, like, whilst trying to re maintain like a vacuum at the very core of your understanding of things, I think that would be fucking hard to do. Well, it, it gives you, it gives you a kind of trajectory, like yeah. the way I said, where I put away religion, um, that was what gave me propellant uh, further into different philosophical questions mm -hmm. and different personal experiences that I wouldn't have had if I hadn't adopted that existential vacuum. Um, so you grab ideas and you let them go. Like the ideas themselves have an agenda the way you said, but your soul also has an agenda of intuitively knowing which ideas are going to help propel it yeah. to where it feels it needs to go next. Um, and the whole question of Christianity is because I do feel a responsibility personally to um, re-articulate Alex Gray style, like re-articulate something spiritual about existence that is that did that does today what christ did in his day where he took jewish thought jewish monotheism and democratized it made it open source and yeah. so there's some similar update and democratization thing mm. happening here or maybe Maybe it still needs to like crystallize into something new and uh, potent first, um, in a more in behind closed doors for a while still before the the word capital W can be spread on high. Um, I, I think the crucial 
the crucial thing is creativity. Uh, of course, I'm going to latch onto that as like a crucial tenet of a spiritual life is creativity and uh, fertility um, and having a fruit bearing life, uh, having your life bear fruit that is good for pretty much everyone that comes to pick that fruit. Um, uh, and Christ, not as a, uh, we, we talk about Christ specifically in dogmatic terms, uh, of it, he's important because of humans sinful nature. And uh, we were taking our sinful nature as a first cause of philosophical thought and and christ is the answer to that but um obviously original sin is bullshit and just used to enslave populations uh obviously to me um and christ is much more crucially a creator and to so to spill uh, uh when he was saying he was the son of God, mm. uh, in fact, if you've looked on me, you've seen God, uh, he's saying, I am a creator. I create worlds. Oh, interesting. Uh, from void, I make something. I make worlds. And it is good that I make that. As that's, that's as distinct from like a prophet, which a prophet is not necessarily claiming. It's just a prophet is claiming to be a conduit not not the actual article christ is claiming like no i actually create from nothing and then he said you will do better than me um like the people that go from me and from us our uh progeny will will improve upon my works uh in, in and spreading his uh whatever his Christ juice <laughs> on everybody is just existentially saying like, you're a creator too. There's no excuses to you. If I'm a child of God, then everyone can be a child of God. Well, they did used to tell me in my Christian school that you should try to be Christ like. And I think what the teachers meant was that you shouldn't be mean to other kids, but maybe what they really meant is that you should try to create the universe. Well, I think that's what Christ meant. And I think it could only be interpreted in the sacrificial, ob sacrifice obsessed, uh, original sin attached uh, yeah. dogma of the times. And yeah. so his message got translated to, um, well, we burnt, we, nailed him to a we sacrificed him so um we're done sacrificing i guess um i I, th I think it's this like it's just really hard to be creative and so it's you you look for anything to weasel your way out of that um I, again i'm thinking of elon musk like how did, how did, what was his first thing? His, his first thing was uh, typing, was putting the yellow pages yeah. on the internet. Isn't that crazy? And so that's I, like- It was like x.com or something like that. That's like thousands and thousands of hours of really tight code on a really shitty computer uh, that he was then, he then got like 20 million out of that. Um, but he got 20 million because he fucking like worked his ass off, like inhuman amounts of work, like Christ like amounts of work. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, Alex, we need to start a, a spiritual guru, business, self help, pub <laughs> self publishing <laughs> NFT. <laughs> it's going to make so much money. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just saying there's a market for it now. Um, no, but I, I, what you're, I, I like that lens of looking at Christ as the creator 
um, because it centers the power and responsibility in you. Um, yes. It really sucks to have responsibility without power. Yeah. If you're going to have responsibility, you might as well take the power. Like, um, power without any responsibility is probably the worst. Well, yes. actually, it's probably just as bad as responsibility without power. They, it sucks. You need them together. They, they go together. You can't, you can't disintegrate them and take one and not the other. Um, yes. I feel like... What was I going to say? Oh, um, there was a scene in uh, the movie Holy Mountain. It was produced by Alejandro Jodorowsky, same guy who made Dune. This was one of his first movies, though. <clears throat> it was, I think he was like 1970, 1971 or something like that. Holy his, Mountain. His second film. Was it? So you sounds like you're very familiar with it. I'm, I'm not. surprised. Oh, you just know about Jodorowsky's <laughs> films. Okay. It, it was a allegorical tale of the mystic the seeker um, trying to find the ultimate truth. And in the very beginning of the movie, there's a scene, it starts off where um, Jesus gets crucified and um, the Romans, as it were, create the plaster cast of the cross and they put it safely up on top of their cathedral. And all the people leave Jesus and Jesus is laying there going like, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> and all the people are like, are bored with him and go to the building where there's the plaster cast of the cross. And they're like, Ooh, and Jesus is like, no. <laughs> and so it's this kind of disturbing implication that like, we haven't had Christianity for a really long time. It kind of mm -hmm. got shut down in about a hundred years and it became the Roman state religion. So we don't even really know what Christianity is. It probably has something a lot to do with occult Greek mysticism more than anything else. Um, you know, well, I, I think know. there's some think, OG hippies that pursued that a little bit, I think, with Gnosticism and the Kabbalah and all that shit. I think we do know what real Christianity is, and I think it looks something like what Elon Musk is doing. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah, I mean, he is pursuing math, science, natural philosophy. Him and Aristotle would probably be pals. Like, I think... I think the soul, this is, this is my prompt now mm -hmm. of what's more natural to a human being to start five, six different companies and run them all simultaneously and uh, seek the highest level of quality you can achieve uh, with every single project or sit on your couch and drink Bud Light. Which is, which is more distinctly human? Which, which is more naturally the human being doing as a human ought to do? Mm. Doing as the human is built to do. Um, and I think to be a lot, to be lit by a fire inside is to have more juice than you know what to do with. Like if he had more time, and Elon Musk and more arms, uh, Elon Musk would be running 10 companies instead of five or however oh, many more it is. actual arms, like fucking like the, the Hindu goddess. Yeah, that'd be mm -hmm. amazing. You could be like typing on like six different monitors at once. Like it's 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 not like like f for me to go from a day job to and uh being a recording artist and working a day job so I could pay for the recording to now doing five different things, uh, my day job included, uh, my band included, this podcast included. It's not more work to do it. It feels better. Yeah. It feels better to be doing more. And uh, like, I, I, I don't have anything on my chest like i i go to sleep at night and i sleep deeply and i have like exciting work to do and um it like the ability to do one project well breeds the ability to do two three four projects well yeah <clears throat> So maybe maybe Christ was just weak sauce 
that he only was able to preach for two years. <laughs> I guess he built houses, so that's pretty amazing. Bro, didn't you hear? After he was done with um, Israel, he, he cruised over to North America, bro. Taught the Indians. <laughs> oh, right. Joseph Smith told us that. <laughs> right, 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 yes. He was like fucking Santa Claus. He was all over the world <laughs> landing with his reindeer and bringing mushrooms to the people i don't know i i really think that um you know maybe like like the archetype of christ i think pops up all the time from in places in various places in the world um they're even like quite explicitly you know there was a guy apparently there was like a there's a guy in russia or there was i think he got like in trouble with the law or something but there was a guy in russia who basically told everyone guys i'm jesus like jesus came back and he's me and <laughs> he like got a bunch of followers and got huge on instagram and like um in russia of all places i, I wish we could look this guy up i'll send a link to it so we can put a thing up but he um i think he th really thought he was jesus and so <laughs> i think he like maybe he was like maybe Jesus is decentralized. Like that, yes, that, I like, think there's like there's like 500 Jesuses right now, and they're all they're all you know, there's like one there's like a black Jesus, a Russian Jesus, a yeah. South American Jesus. You know, I don't know, I don't know. It's probably just there's people that just randomly get that idea in their mind, and some people are like, oh, it's a metaphor to be productive, like Christ, like like we're doing, we're doing this thing where we like we try to allegorize it and see the general, see the truth without the person. But I think there's some people who just don't see the don't see it don't think it's necessary to um maybe like you didn't have much of an identity to begin with and that's the most powerful thought you've ever had and so you're like uh -huh. yes like you see this with people who were former for, who were like homeless they have nothing they're on the street and they're just fucking rock bottom and so they find jesus and that's where they break even and their life after that is way better because they have something to you know give them a sense that like it's worth it to keep going it's worth it to not die it's worth it to not keep drinking whatever that thing is you know it's um it's almost it seems very necessary for humans like it's mm -hmm. a technology for survival to have some kind of anchor point yeah yeah it's it's a technology i i think it's within it's completely within the untapped potential of the human mind to adopt archetypes yeah and then become inflamed by them inflamed and yeah. and then rise to levels of achievement that wouldn't have been possible otherwise yeah. um yeah christ is a decentralized uh he he's in the cloud um available to be downloaded to anyone who can like well, to anyone, I guess that's that's the point of the myth. It's like Amazon Christ services. <laughs> <laughs> you just like you like to sign up twenty five dollars a month. You have like a you have like a Christ API that you can mm -hmm. like use to deploy applications to like <laughs> fulfill the market for existential uh, questions in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, dude, there's something like that. I mean, that's kind of what. Okay. You know, you could have here. This is my fucking thing about NFTs. You could make NFTs about whatever you want. What does it say that the first things that got NFTified, it, it, art was the first thing that got NFTified because people understand that it art is somehow spiritual, it's somehow divine. So it's the first likeliest candidate to be trotted out to replace the God image in society. Mm -hmm. um, and artists are, I mean, that's why artists live by, they're held to like a little bit of a different standard in society because they're seen as, they're not like some of the common folk. They're like people who dip the ladle down into the mystical well and thus are like liable to expose themselves to some weird ideas. And so you don't really hold it against them too much. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know anymore if this is relevant, but it. I get a free pass with like the most liberal SJW woke people um, 
and like the most liberal places in California, like Davis or like Sacramento or a health co-op in Davis in Sacramento. Um, I, I get a free pass because they can tell I'm that weird yeah. kind of mutant artist thing. Yeah. Uh, like I'm specifically thinking of, uh, completely forgetting about wearing my mask. Like yeah. I just, I just forgot. Yeah. And I was in a natural food store, uh, back where everyone was working and was back there for, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. And everyone was just same as always smiling and saying hi and going about their business. And, um, and I didn't even, I didn't even notice that I didn't have a mask on until I'd left. And yeah, it, and I think it's because they intuitively saw someone who wasn't like retracting from right. it wasn't some negative statement of fuck masks. It was some positive statement of like, I'm taking reality seriously. I'm progressing on as many fronts as possible. And so that's like, that's an Uber mask as far as virtues, mm. as far as virtue signaling is concerned. Dude, looking weird is the, anti <laughs> is the anti mask. No, I'm not, I'm not like, not like just to, to clarify, not anti mask, the anti mask. You know how like, um, like in the dare, like the war, the war on drugs or drug, you know, you know, you know, dare. I'm talking about they come yeah, to your yeah. school and they tell you about drugs and stuff. They tell you that it's possible to actually get high by sniffing a marker, and actually none of the kids knew that, but they do now. But <laughs> I don't know. I'm just kidding. Don't try that, kids. It's, it's pretty low class. That, um, <laughs> in any case, um, yeah, the anti-drug was alternatively, depending on which one you attended, it was like friends, family, faith. Like, depending on if you're at a Christian school or not. Like, God, obviously, is the anti-drug if you're at a Christian school. But if you're, like, at a public school, it's, like, like self-esteem or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I feel like being a, a weirdo is a way of slipping into a greater diversity of social spaces. Because people aren't really threatened by you because you you're not useful for them to compare, to compare themselves against. And that's what they really want. If you walk, if, 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 uh, you know, like MAGA hat, cowboy boots, what the hell kind of natural food bullshit, <laughs> soy, what the fuck? <laughs> Pulling your pickup truck and you're just like, yeah, you're like, you're like, what the f masks, you know, <laughs> if, 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 when you walk into that store, all those people that work there are secretly, on the outside, they're going to be like, oh, my God. But on the inside, they're going to be like, yes. Oh, I've been waiting for one of these motherfuckers to walk in here. Right, I'm just right. Tell them what I think. And they then, like, when that, yeah, now that, when that person eventually leaves, they're all going to look at each other and be like, oh, my God. Now we have something to talk about for the rest of the day. <laughs> yes. And so, like, you're doing them a service. Whereas if you're, like, just weird and you're like, oh, I have, like, dreads and a mohawk and, like, I'm kind of weird. And they're like, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't really, I don't, this guy doesn't, I can't confirm anything about myself by creating the mirror image of this because we're too similar yeah. aesthetic, aesthetically. So it's yeah. whatever, whatever, man. Like, I guess it's fine if you don't wear a mask. Like, it's, is, it's pretty funny. Is that vacuum coming through in your audio right now? Only the spiritual vacuum. I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, no, it isn't. Okay, cool. So, uh, Hopefully I don't have to move then. Um, uh, again, with what real spirituality is and how that podcast, that Christian Babylon B podcast, uh, Elon Musk is the most spiritual person in the room. I think like just reality is the anti-drug uh, or reality is the Christ molecule reality um, is the pro drug like reality is the drug dealer <laughs> yeah <laughs> R reality is pretty psychedelic yeah and just just meeting reality 
is enough to light your spiritual fire. Um, just telling the truth to yourself uh, at all costs, always telling the truth to yourself and to others and meeting reality in as pure terms as possible, um, it makes you a better person. Um, like Ayn Rand was a professed atheist and her philosophy completely consisted of looking at reality and accepting and working with reality and using your mind to work with reality as rigorously as possible. And she calls herself an atheist, but she saved my soul. And she, she seems very spiritual to me in this completely affirmative uh, stance towards existence. Like it is good. You are good. This is good. Let's do things with this. Um, just facing the facts evolves you in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Reality is, is, is it's as psychedelic as you can stand. Yes. That's very well put, but facing up, working with how much you can stand it, it, makes you grow yeah. and then you can stand even more. Mm. Yeah. That recalls what something you said earlier kind of resonated with me. Um, I was talking about how ideas have their own agenda in the sense that they're using humans to replicate. And you said the soul also has its agenda um, in deciding what ideas it's going to let take advantage of it. It's what, what ideas it's going to enter into a relationship with. Um, cause it's kind of transactional in a way. I think that, um, there are some ideas which are symbiotes like mitochondria where your soul can take into it certain symbolic constructs, which benefit you. Mm -hmm. And there's some symbolic constructs that will obviously just parasitize you, parasit mm -hmm. parasitize your energy. So it's, a uh, there's a pretty diverse selection of um, there's a lot of items on the menu right now. I think that's what we can say. And well, uh, I, I have a pet thought in response to that, that they're all symbiotes, all the ooh, ideas. Interesting. How so? All, if you accept a parasite, if we're talking about your soul's trajectory, yeah, then your soul kind of, by definition, your soul kind of is uh, um, inviolable and uh, just seeks to grow and learn. Um, and uh, an eternity of like uh, samsara and reincarnational experiences is still leaves your soul intact at the end of them and another eternity awaits you after that and from that perspective you only take parasitic limiting trapping thoughts for your own purposes and people people um stay within circumscribed sandboxes of dogma because their soul understands that that's the only amount of reality that they can take. Yeah. It's not ready yet. To it's go not outside. ready for anything more. Yeah. 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 Like I think there's a, I think cigarette, I think that's the secret to cigarette addiction is people intuitively know that if they don't start working right now, they're going to live till they're like 120. Like if they don't start like working to cut that lifespan down right now, they're going to live way longer than they think they want to. So like self-destructive behaviors is just like a nice, slow, easy glide into the abyss kind of. Yeah. On some level, a cigarette addicted person has decided how long they want to live. And it's like 70 or 80 years. Yeah. That's how much they want. And someone even fucking said this to me like she said it out loud to me in passing the other day and she's overweight this girl 
And I don't remember what it was in regards to, but in response to that, she said, this is why I'm glad I'm not going to live very long because of shit like this. Like it, and you could tell by her attitude that she was consciously building like a 40 year lifespan for herself. You know, I can, on some level, I can kind of respect that. It's, it's inarguable. Every, every person, if we're talking about souls, there's as many different reasons to be human as there are humans on the earth. Yeah. And my rule set or my set of goals is not another person's set of goals. No. So when I talk about health and when I talk about being proactive about a spiritual journey, I'm talking about how to practically build a mind that can live for 300 years uh, without going insane. And so like eating vegetables is important to a person like that and meditating and going on walks in nature and living in a town with a bunch of trees that's really bicycle friendly mm. um, and taking naps. These, these are all things that are important to me. And then I like take it for granted that it'd be better if everyone did that, but not really because not everyone wants to live very long or learn and do as much as I want to. I'm really happy that everyone's not doing what I'm doing because that would just be a lot more competition. I am actually hope that no one else does what I'm doing. <laughs> I spend a lot of time really being afraid that other people are doing what I'm doing. I don't want them to. Um, I feel like uh, it's great to be unique. Like, I don't know, man. I feel like we need to go back to the 90s and just bring back like, we need to bring back like vapor wave and self-esteem and shit like that. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, like, you need to like bust out our like light light brights and fucking just like create the vision rainbow vision of the future so we can all just you know ring, read a book together and increase literacy and I don't know it just seems so naive I don't know I I, th I think that like there's a kind of there's a, inevitably there's going to be a crashing back to earth of cultures sort of self-conscious virtue aspirations it can't go on forever uh, sooner or later there's going to be a decade like the 80s again where people are like uh it's not cool to be good anymore the new it's the new good thing is to be bad and then <laughs> you get the 80s and then like you know if you look at the punk movement movement nowadays actually more so Punks are the biggest motherfucking virtue signalers that currently exist at the moment. And the reason yes. is because they, their brand is to be the rebels. And, it's, and because they're all rebels, the real punks have to go back to saying what the establishment wants you to think. And be like, oh, I'm like triple vaxxed and boosted and you're not. Like, <laughs> like yeah, fuck, yeah, stick it to the man. Okay. <laughs> like, I, did, I did the thing that the sign at the bus stop said I should do, guys. <laughs> Why haven't you done it? Do you like my leather jacket and my little patch that says anarchy or whatever? And like, no, not hot topic, actual anarchy. No. <laughs> Fucking. I just... So I, but I feel like sooner or later, like the punks are all, they're all like fucking crusty Gen Xers, you know, um, at this point. So there's going to be a new iteration of that. And, uh, you know, after a while that one will be phony too, but that's fine because you surf the wave while it's in the prime of its life in the juiciest, most transcendent, transient, um, just ephemeral, you know, what's the word? Like, there's there's a lot of sayings to this effect. Like, strike while the iron is hot, make hay while the sun shines, carpe diem, carpe, carpe noctum, you know what I mean? Yeah, uh, and that's, yeah. that's basically, in my mind, that's the same as meeting reality. 
yeah. and yeah. In, insisting mm -hmm. on insisting on reality as the arbiter of uh, what you're going to do and what you're going to respond to. And that includes your inner reality, um, which is important. Reality is only half what you see out there. It's also half what you feel in here. Um, but de dealing with reality, um, it happens to change every single moment. So meeting, like dealing with the reality in an affirmative way uh, requires a high degree of uh, wakefulness and adaptability and creativity. Um, and the rules that worked yesterday may or may not be the rules that work today if your final arbiter is reality itself. Um, anyway, we we could probably call it. We're about to go to yeah, the next that was a, session. That was a tight set of ideas. <laughs> for the bill. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah, it's better with these zoom zoom things to um, yeah. cut 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 while we're ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, man. Well, talk to you soon. Will you um be 